Hi, in this video we're going to be looking at a new project that I've been working on and also to give you a few hints and tips for when you get your PCBs assembled at JLC PCB. So this project is a NTP clock. So what it's going to do is either fetch the time off the internet or from an NTP server and then give the time on the clock face. Now we're going to be covering a few different timing topics this year. Um, this is the first of those. The next one is we're going to rebuild a GPS disciplined oscillator and this will be using modern parts that you'll be able to build yourself at home as well. And potentially we're going to try and create an NTP server on that GPN, GPS disciplined oscillator unit as well. Um, I have done a video a long, long time ago when I first started this channel about a GPS disciplined oscillator that I modified and updated a little bit. Unfortunately, when we moved house, it got trashed uh, by the removal company. So, um, you know, it sustained some damage and it no longer works properly. So we're going to be building a new one. Uh, but this video is about this NTP clock, which is based around a design which I was um, I really quite liked. I've seen them in broadcasting studios. It's based around a brand called Wharton. And they make these clocks for broadcasting studios where you've got sort of the hours, minutes and seconds. But then there's also this really nice clock face with all the markers uh, and this increments as the seconds go up. So I really quite liked that design. So what I've done is basically implemented it on a PCB that we're actually going to get assembled at JLC PCB. I think I've achieved almost 100% coverage in terms of getting components placed on the board. So you can see... Actually, each digit, uh, this is just the silk screen at the moment, each digit is made up from a whole bunch of 0805 LEDs on each of these little positions here. So we've got our hours, minutes, seconds, and then here's our clock face with the seconds going all around. Our ESP32, which is going to drive this whole thing, is sitting at the top of the board. I did order a little dev board to have a little play with. Uh, I also had a play quite a while ago with an ESP8266, but it didn't quite have enough power to do what I need it to do. Um, so the ESP32 with its dual core, I'm hoping should be able to drive all of these LEDs. Now, the clock face is only one part of this. Um, I've also included an LED matrix at the bottom of the board. So I think there's about one and a half thousand LEDs at the bottom here. And these are all going to be multiplexed. The whole unit is going to be multiplexed from this ESP32. So I'm really hoping that it has the capabilities to drive this, otherwise we might be stuck with relatively low refresh rates. Uh, and then at the bottom here we've just got some DC to DC converters. Let's have a little closer look at the actual PCB. So here it is in Proteus. And you can see here, if you look closely, basically we've got groups of LEDs. So um, I've built the whole design around groups of three LEDs and then they're all driven uh, individually. So we've got a couple of LEDs here, another set of three, another set of three, and another th set of three, and that creates the segment A, segment B, uh, segment C, D, E, F, and G. And then similarly, for each of the markers, we've got a group of three LEDs again. So we've got quite a lot of LEDs all the way around the display, and the main reason for that is because JLC PCB can only currently assemble surface mount parts. So to get the illusion of sort of a five millimeter LED, uh, what I've ended up doing is putting a group of three 0805 LEDs together to simulate the, a similar kind of look. At the top here, we've got some of the cathode drivers. These are all the ones that are associated with driving the clock face. And then here we've got the LED matrix, which is really simple to route, but quite laborious. If I left the auto router to do this, it came up with a complete mess. So I did actually have to hand place and hand tra track each of these LEDs on here. And then at the bottom, we've got all of the transistors for driving the columns. We've got some um, shift registers along the bottom. These are 74HC595 shift registers. And then at the very bottom of the board is where all of our DC to DC converters are. So let's have a little look at the schematic. Here you can see we've got uh, what each of the segments looks like. So this is the A segment. It's made from four groups of three LEDs. And basically it's fed from a common anode. And then each segment here has a common cathode. And we can have a look at the drivers for this. So to drive each of the 
uh, cathodes, we've got basically an open collector type arrangement, but with the resistor on the emitter leg. And that means that if we feed in a specific voltage into the base here, we get a constant current through those LEDs. And I've done a video on that uh, previously. If you want to have a look at that, uh, then click on the link above. And then simply a very standard 74HC595 shift register array where basically the data is clocked in and it passes from shift register to shift register. And because these are the 74HC595s, we can shift that data in quite slowly because we have the ability to latch the data into the output registers all in one go. Having a little look at the anode drivers, basically we're driving these with P-channel MOSFETs. What that means is we have to have a little bit of interfacing logic to get the correct drive levels because those LEDs need about 15 volts in order to drive properly with those constant current drivers. So we're driving this from 15 volts. We've got an open collector type arrangement here with these transistors which are being fed from another shift register uh, which selects which anode to turn on. On this page we've got our LED matrix array and there's not really a whole lot to show here. Basically it's just a whole bunch of LEDs with common anodes and then on the columns we've got the common cathodes and the common cathodes all feed down into these open collector transistors and then into the shift registers which enable which line to turn on. In terms of the actual processing power, here's the ESP32. There's nothing too exciting about the design here, but I did include all of the components that we would need to be able to program the ESP32 on board. Uh, so that does mean we need a few transistors. I basically just copied this off the uh, little dev board that I've got here so that I can replicate it um, on the actual main board itself. Then we've got a few buttons just in case we want to be able to set the time or set the menus or even put in something like the Wi-Fi code if we need to. Because we've got the LED matrix at the bottom of the whole unit, uh, we've got a little bit more interactivity. We could have some menus if we absolutely need it. Other than that, there's not a huge amount on the board. We've got a couple of DC to DC converters. So this whole thing is going to accept a 12 volt input. Then we've got two DC to DC converters, one providing the higher voltage uh, for the clock face where we've got the three sets of LEDs in series and another one at a lower voltage 6.5 volts for driving the LED matrix. So these are based around firstly the Texas Instruments LM2596 which I think is the one that we actually used uh, for the power supply in the field tech signal generator. So a fairly standard book regulator design here and that gives us our 6.5 volts and then that just feeds into a linear 3.3 volt regulator for all of the logic on the board. So I did have to do a little bit of optimization in terms of the bill of materials. This is probably the only part that was available on JLC PCB for assembly um, that would meet the spec. So this is actually a boost converter. It can actually output something like 4 amps, I think. And the feedback here has been configured to give us our 15 volts output uh, from our 12 volt input. So there's not a huge amount to show in terms of layout stuff. Basically, I needed to go for a four-layer board in order to route this in any kind of effective period of time. We probably could have done it on a two-layer board, but this already took me quite a few weeks to get to this point. I didn't want to try and optimise it any further. So basically, the top layer is the ground plane with all of the main sort of routing. Layer two is, generally speaking, routing from left to right wherever possible. And then layer three is more of the up-down routing. And you can see we've got a split plane here. So on the left-hand side here, we've got our 6.5 volt rail. And on the right-hand side, we've got our 15 volt rail, which goes to generally the top of the board. And there's actually not a great deal on the bottom side of the board. It's mainly just one massive ground plane with just a little bit of the routing for the LED matrix. And what I've tried to do generally speaking, is keep all of the signal layers on the inner two layers. So we sort of get some shielding from the ground planes on layer one and layer four. So we'll see how effective that is when we actually get the boards made. Let's have a little look at what I've done in terms of optimization of the bill of materials. Now, when you're designing your schematic, with it already in mind that you're going to get it assembled at JLC PCB, you do need to bear in mind 
what parts they're likely to have in stock and what parts they're likely to be able to have assembled onto your board. So if you go on the JLC PCB website, you do need to have a look at the parts library. This also gives you an idea of which parts are going to be from the basic library where you can have a limited number of parts or whether you have to go to the extended library of which you can only have 10 different types on your order. So I've had to do a little bit of playing around with all of the components so that I can get basically the entire board apart from the ESP32 assembled onto the board. So, um, you know, it's quite nice. They've got a whole array of different parts available. For example, I could pick these 0805 white LEDs. They are basic parts, so they're not using up one of the 10 slots. But um, they've actually got a whole different uh, range of white LEDs which are suitable. And I've had really good results with the LEDs from Everlight. So actually, I decided not to use the basic part in this design. And I've gone for the extended part. So... These are the kind of things you need to bear in mind. And then when you're creating your bill of materials, it's really useful in that bill of materials to include the LCSC part number just because it speeds up the whole order process, as you'll see in a moment. Now, in terms of the bill of materials itself, uh, this may be restricted only to certain um, PCB packages, but at least in Proteus, you get one line for every single item on the list, which means that you've got a massive... Uh, bill of materials list here and if I was to go through and check every part and add the LCSC part number that's going to take me quite a long time so there's some optimizations you can do to the bill of materials to speed things up and this is basically um, you know the optimized list so you can use some shortcuts for example if you saw on the original bill of materials um, it was actually talking about C10, C11, C12, C13, C14 you can shorten that by just putting C10-17 and that creates a line for the entire parts from C10 all the way up to C17. And you can also add multiple components onto the same line in the bill of materials. So you just have to separate the components by a space. And basically we've got a whole bunch of components here just with one line on the bill of materials. And therefore we can just very quickly pick one part number for all of those parts. Now there are a few restrictions. I think when I originally tried to upload this design, it didn't like having all two and a half thousand or three thousand LEDs on one line. So I did have to break that down into four different groups here. But other than that, um, it all seems to work quite straightforwardly. So what you can actually do is populate all of the part numbers. And then when we go to upload this to the JLC PCB website, we don't actually have to select any parts. We can just run through the order process nice and quickly. There we go, so it's finally uploaded, and it's quite a big board, 335mm by 220 so bigger than an A4 sheet of paper. And given that it's a four-layer board and we're getting five of these made, it's only coming in at $76. Now, obviously, we are going to go for the Immersion Gold finish, and they've also added a new option to remove the JLC PCB order number. So we will click that option. Um, it only costs $1.50. And then we're going to click the SMT assembly. So we're going to assemble the top side. Basically, we've got no components on the underside. And I think the only parts that we're not going to be able to get fitted here is the light sensor, the terminal block, and the ESP32. So everything else here we should be able to get assembled. So let's have a look at this. There is a limit, I've been told, in terms of the number of parts that can be placed. So there's a maximum of 3,000 lines in the pick and place uh, file. We've got 2,689. So we're getting close. This is probably pushing the limits of JLC PCB. But I'm quite excited to see how this turns out. So we've got the files here, the bill of materials. And then we've got the pick and place file as well. That's just taking a moment, and we, then we can click Next. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to upload the schematics and the bill of materials to my website. So take a look at the links above, but I would really like it if you guys would have a look at the schematic and basically review it for me as well. I've been over it a few times. Basically, I've got until uh, the Chinese come back from Chinese New Year and um, the short break that they've had to deal with the... Uh, coronavirus so I think they're back next Monday it'd be really good if you guys could have a look and see if I've gone wrong or if there's any suggestions uh, but here we've got the uh, the various parts 
And you can see because we included the LCSC part number, now all of this is already pre-selected. We've got all of our LEDs. See, this would have taken a long time for us to do it line by line on here, picking each individual item. We can click Next. And finally, we can check the placement. Now, given that we've got, um, I think we've got about 2,500 LEDs, we're getting uh, five of these boards made. The cost is coming in at about $378. So this is quite expensive, but we're getting five boards made here. This, uh, I'm really hoping that this works first time. I really don't want uh, all the LEDs to be the wrong way around. But what you can do is zoom in on here and individually check the placement. So you can see we've got all of our LEDs. Uh, we've got all of the SOT23 parts that are quite very round. We've got the, uh, the drivers here with pin 1 next to pin 1. And basically, although this does get checked by a technician at JLC PCB, it's worthwhile going over it first now because you can very easily go to the pick and place file. In fact, I'll just show you quickly. If we go to the pick and place file, any parts, so these are some of the parts that I actually had to correct. You can see here, all you have to do is change the rotation. So for example, these were backwards, they were reading minus 90. So I've just flipped those around and corrected them. And now when we look at all of the parts, you know, everything is the correct way wound. So hopefully we've got all of this correct, got all of our switches in the right place. I did put a quick indication here as well so that you can see which way the LEDs are supposed to be. So any vertical ones are anode at the top, cathode at the bottom, and any horizontal ones with the anode at the right hand side. So anode and cathode. And what I will also do probably is include a little build sheet just so they can check what it's supposed to look like. But here you can see we've basically got all of the parts placed, lots and lots of LEDs, and the only unselected parts are basically the titles in the bill of materials, which is to be expected. So $378. It should take around a week from actually accepting the order to uh, it being ready to ship. So um, yeah, it'd be really good if you guys could have a look at the files at the link above and let me know if either I've made any mistakes or if you've got any suggestions. So um, obviously we're going to cover more in depth about how the clock works once we actually get the boards. Uh, we'll bring it up uh, slowly, we'll get the NTP clock working, we'll start getting the multiplexing working, uh, you know, and then build it up from there. So hopefully you enjoyed this relatively uh, quick video. It's just running through basically this design so that when the boards arrive, uh, you know, it's not all new to you guys. So hopefully you enjoyed the video. Until next time, thanks for watching.